Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Man Up Men's Health monthly discussion. September is Prostate Cancer Awareness Month, and I find no better way to begin this discussion or to have this discussion about prostate cancer. Today we have a good friend of mine uh, who is a nationally recognized men's health expert. His name is Dr. Kevin Billups. Dr. Billups is a professor of urology at Meharry Medical College, and he is a leader in the field of men's health in Nashville, Tennessee. Today, we'll discuss all the things that you may have thought about with prostate cancer. Let's invite Dr. Billups in to the discussion. Dr. Right. Billups, welcome. Thank you. Thank so you. let's start off with something very straightforward that we probably don't think a whole lot about. What is the prostate? So the prostate, well, that's a central organ for uh, uh, urology, obviously. But so the, the, uh, the, the prostate, it's actually a, it's a, it's a walnut-sized gland for a lot of our lives. And it sits between the bladder and the penis or the urethra. So if you think, so, so the flow of urine, when, when a man makes urine, it, the, it flows into the bladder, but it has to flow through the prostate and on out through the penis in order for you to uh, uh, urinate. So when you look at the prostate, it does have, a, it does have a, a, a function. It has a reproductive function. It secretes enzymes that actually help uh, uh, liquefy the semen. So when you initially ejaculate, what happens is your semen is kind of a, a gel form. It has to, to, to liquefy to kind of free up the sperm. So it, it does have a, 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 a purpose from that. Now, other than that, for men, unfortunately, as we get older, it causes problems because it can either, it can either enlarge in a, in a benign way and, and, and block your, your flow of urine. Um, it can get infected or inflamed, what we call prostatitis. Or, as we're going to talk more about today, it, it can uh, develop prostate cancer. Well, clearly, um, my next question is no longer a question. I was going to ask you, uh, did we need it? <laughs> but, but clearly, you've suggested to me that we do need this gland. So tell me, what can we do to prevent anything going wrong? Since you say, as we get older, we may run into problems. What can we do to prevent these problems? So prostate health is important and, 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 and you know my philosophy very much is prostate health is part of overall men's health. So, so, so if, if you look at, at what can you do specifically uh, for your uh, uh, prostate, I would say number one is, is understand the symptoms of when things are going wrong. Now, now if you look at the symptom of when your prostate is enlarging and it's blocking the urinary flow, the symptoms there of the first thing a man will notice, and this usually happens and most men, when you get 40-ish and over, but it can happen earlier. So you'll notice your, your, uh, when you urinate, it's just not as fast. You may be having to strain to get the urine to, to, to come out. You may be having to get up a lot at night to go to the bathroom. You know, you may be, you, you may be going frequently in the, in the daytime or feeling like you don't, you don't empty. Those are urinary symptoms that are often related to what we call benign prostate enlargement. Um, if you get pain down in the, in the groin or what we call the perineum, which is kind of down underneath your uh, scrotum uh, or tenderness, uh, that can be a sign of inflammation or prostatitis. And a lot of times it's not an infection. The most common form of prostatitis is, is actually an inflammation. Now the question I always get asked is, what's the symptom of prostate cancer, the early symptom? Right. And the answer is there is no early symptom for prostate cancer most of the time. And that's what we, I'm, I'm sure we'll talk in a little bit about things we can do there. But, but first thing to me is, is, is educational sessions like this to understand these are the symptoms I have when I'm having some, some prostate problems. And then you don't want to ignore those symptoms, right? As men, we tend to be a little more on the side of ignoring things and coming in later. But you want to come in, in, in sooner to get this checked. So that's really interesting. So I want to go back to what you just said about this prostate and where it's located. And you say one of the big symptoms we may see with this benign prostate enlargement mm -hmm. is that there's trouble with urine passing. So yes. having trouble going to the bathroom. So well, there are other things that pass through there. Uh, will we have trouble with that passing as well? And, and I'm referring to semen. So with the semen, actually, it, this will more be with urinary flow. Now, you can have problems with, with semen if you, have, if you take certain medicines that relax your prostate. 
so 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 that you know if you if you're having that problem or if you have surgery on the inside of of, of the prostate you, a lot of men may notice that the the they don't see as much semen coming out and that's because in, in the normal anatomy, when you ejaculate, everything closes down and the semen takes the, the path of least resistance is to come out the front of the penis. Mm -hmm. If you're on certain medicines or if you've had surgery, the path of least resistance is actually going back in the bladder. So you may not, you may not see that. But, but so, so that's a symptom, it's, that's a specialized symptom with the ejaculation. The, the urinary symptom is the one I really want men to understand because that's the one, I mean, if you think about it, you can think of the prostate, the way I always say, if, if, if my hand were a fist, and my finger is kind of the urinary stream going through through the through the fist, and the bladder's up here, and the penis is down there. If I were to squeeze my that that, that finger, then that's the urethra, and, and that's with growth. What happens is it's gonna it's gonna choke that of that that flow off, right? And and so that's where you get problems with the bladder then having to push more to get past this obstruction. What happens is initially your bladder becomes very muscular, and it can force its way, it can force the urine out. What people don't realize is that over time, if that happens too long, your bladder muscle gives out. And when your bladder muscle gives out, that is not good. Because at that point, it doesn't matter if we can give you medicine or we can do surgery to open the, the obstruction up, your bladder doesn't work. And that's what you don't want. So that's why you don't want to just ignore these symptoms when they show up. Okay, so, so what you described to me is the passage through that little duct that goes between the uh, the prostate and and into the penis. That's called yeah. It's called the the urethra. The urethra. The urethra. Okay. Right. And right. So so is it just the duct that's affected, or do we expect blood vessels to be affected too, where the flow to the penis is going to be affected? So is, it it really what I'm talking about more is, is is it's a physical obstruction. So you can think about it. That's the inside of the of the prostate the the prostate gland that grows. That's the benign growth. That's primarily the benign growth. Okay. So people always you know pe people always you know ask. You can't. There's only one way to really get a, a a direct look at that benign growth, and that's to do what we call a cystoscopy, where we have to go down through your penis with a, with a with a flexible scope and take and take a look. Um, but 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 yeah, that's that's benign tissue growth most of the, most of the time that leads to the urinary symptoms. Now, prostate cancer for the most part occurs in a different part of the gland on the outside of the, of the gland. Gotcha. Now, Kevin, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to this that you mentioned that the reason the prostate can be enlarged is because of inflammation. So can you just take ibuprofen or aspirin or something to reduce this inflammation? No, so, 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 so you have different processes that can go on, they can go on at the same time. So you can have benign enlargement and you can have this, in, this inflammatory uh, process going on too. As a matter of fact, there's some work out there now that looks at could the inflammation be an early stage and that helps trigger some of this, 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 this growth and things like that. So, um, they, you know, I use ibuprofen in some men, or or, or uh, as to, to help if they have a non a non bacterial inflammation, not to decrease the it's not going to decrease the tissue growth. It really it, it really fights the symptom of in, inflammation. Um, I don't think that's the ideal treatment though, because you know there, there are side effects right to, to being on long term use of uh, of that. So so. You know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit l uh, later about some of the other things I can do that, that, that you can fight inflammation in the, in the body that I think are useful. So let, let me just be clear that you're saying that when you have these problems, that's not a sign, like with the urinary problem, that's not really a sign that you have prostate cancer. There's just a sign that something's not right with your prostate. Yes, I would say it's a sign that something's not right with your prostate. Now, could even on that inner part where you get the enlargement on the inside, you can rarely have cancers grow in there. But, but that, is, that, that symptom is one of urinary symptoms, right? If, if, if where, where prostate cancer usually grows on the outside of the gland, you don't get those urinary symptoms until, until it's very late stage, right? You don't, you don't want to have symptoms if it's the traditional prostate cancer that we think about. Now, you mentioned that when we're thinking about some of these things, there's an age that we, you know, around what age should we expect to start even seeing some of the benign enlargements of the prostate? So how old should I say that, um, that you should expect that? Yeah, so I, you know, I would say, and, and again, this, this, this obviously varies some, but, but I usually tell men, 
when you get when you get into your 40s, men can start having some of these urinary symptoms. The older you get, 50, 60, there's more of a, a chance you can have it. What's interesting is I see some men, you know, late mid, you know, mid late 60s who don't have any urinary symptoms. Uh, you know, and, and I, I I have some men who are, are much younger and they start to have these some of these uh, symptoms. So. There are a lot of different variable factors that can go on, but, but on average, I tell men when they get into that 40-ish age range that they should be paying attention to that. Honestly, what we try and do now is we, we even try to educate men in their 30s so you, so you know what's coming down the road and you kind of know what to expect. And then what the hope is that maybe we won't ignore these symptoms and we'll be a little more proactive. Okay, since we're still talking about symptoms and age that these things happen, the next question I have is, why does this seem to happen more with African American men than other other races? Is there something so we, underneath the tone, or is it that we just ignore it? Are we talking about the uh, with the with, you talking about the urinary? So we saw on the on the uh, benign yeah. urinary symptoms right. symptoms now. Uh, you know, some of it could be due to. I, I mean, I, I think environmental factors play a lot. And I, I know we're going to talk later about about where I think nutrition and things like that can impact the, the uh, prostate. I think that that's some of it. Um, I also think that uh, men in general, we're just, um, we're more reactive creatures, right? So, so we can get symptoms and we're just gonna, we're just gonna tolerate it. Cause that's kind of what we were taught playing sports, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so the, the, whereas women are much more proactive, if they get a symptom, they're much more likely to, to, to go in. And I think that goes all the way back to if, if you look at a woman goes from pediatrics to gynecology and gynecology either becomes their primary doctor or they get an immediate handoff. Whereas with men, if you look at it, you know, if, you're, if you're like I was, you go from pediatrics and, and, you know, and where do you go next? I mean, I would get a physical, if you got a sports physical, you know, that's what, turn your head, cough, you don't have a hernia to get back out in the field. Or, or after that, you know, as a, as a, as a young adult, or as a, uh, you know, I would go when I had to go to, I was a Boy Scout camp leader and I couldn't go to camp unless I went and got my physical. So we don't have that handoff. And I think that, so I think we, we, we miss an educational opportunity and we tend to ignore symptoms and put things off. So Dr. Billups, if we're talking about just the more benign things, we hadn't gotten to the prostate cancer discussion yet, if we're just talking about the benign things, is this something that when you're starting to have prostate problems that maybe your wife or your spouse or your partner would pick up on more, uh, maybe they would pick up signs that there's something not right? Or is yes. that something that, that really is all on, on us? To no, I, I, you know, if, if you're, um, your wife or, or significant other, yeah, they're going to notice it. I mean, they're going to notice the urinary symptoms, you know, it, it, or if you're getting up a lot at night or, you know, yes, I, I would say that they would, that they'll definitely notice that. And um, women actually play a huge part, you know, I mean, as, as, as you know, women really kind of control the whole, the whole health care yes. and getting it a lot of time. <laughs> and I mean, the fastest time a guy will come to my office is usually when, when the wife or somebody says, you, you know, you need to get in. I'm gonna make the appointment for you, you're, you're gonna go in. So I think women play a, a, a crucial role. And it's interesting, I give a lot of men's health talks to women's groups, coming from how do you help take care of your man? Because everyone knows that, 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 <laughs> that we tend to delay. And, and, it, and it's not just, we're, we're talking about prostate health, but as we'll get into a little bit, prostate health is related to really your overall you know, metabolic health and wellness. So, so this is all kind of tied together, in, in my opinion. So talk to me a little bit about this metabolic health, because I know you and I've talked about this before as it being one of the key uh, features of understanding prostate health. Yes, yeah, yeah. And, and, and metabolic health impacts a, a number of different things. So it sounds like it's, it's, it's a fancy term, you know, metabolic health, like a big term. It really is not, it's a simple concept. There are four components to metabolic health. You look at what's your blood pressure, what's your cholesterol, what's your blood sugar, and then what's your waist circumference and not at the, it's, it's at the belly button. Everybody wants to get their pants size. That doesn't count. That doesn't count. It's at the belly button because it's, it's that fat in the, around, the, around the midsection that's the bad fat. So, so people look at body mass index or BMI that's based on weight and height, and that's fine, but you also need to look at what the waist circumference. So those four components of metabolic health are important because, because here's an interesting, interesting uh, statistic that 
only 12% of men will have all four of those parameters that are normal. If I mentioned blood pressure, blood sugar, cholesterol, and then a normal waist. Your, your normal waist circumference should be less than 40 inches at the belly button. Actually, ideal it should be less than 37, but less than 40 is like tolerable. So, so, so um, and, and these are easy measurements to know. Only 12% of men will have all four of those normal. The men I see in my clinic, for the most part, they have between two and four of those that are abnormal. Wow. And they think they're doing okay. Wow. A lot of people, guys come, and they think they're doing okay. And so why is that important? Well, it's important because to me, symptoms are often based on the, those four, I call them the four pillars of metabolic health, and that is directly what leads you to getting diabetes, high blood pressure, heart attack, stroke, all these prostate cancer, all of these things are linked to your metabolic health. So what I try and do for men is really link to them. You have a symptom. You gotta understand how that's linked to your metabolic health. So let's go look at these parameters because I know I'm gonna find something that's abnormal. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not gonna come in with those symptoms and, and, and I don't pick up, pick up anything. And then I make that link right away. Well, this is why you're at increased risk for da, 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 da. And, then, and then from there, you know, we, we, we look at how do we address these metabolic health issues. So let's get you to say those again, because it sounds like those are important things yes. for us to know. What are those, these are those so, four things? So blood pressure. Your blood pressure should be less than 120 over 80. That's, that's, a, you know, that, that, that's a hard goal to reach, but, but that's where you want to you wanna aim, aim for. Um, your blood sugar, your, your glucose, it should be less than 100 when you're fasting. Less than, less than 100 fat. If you, if you go over 100, uh, between 100 and, uh, and, uh, and 124, you're what we call pre-diabetic. If you go over, you know, 125, 125 over, then you're actually in the, in the, the, the diabetic range. So, so there's blood pressure, blood sugar, cholesterol. Now, you need to know your whole, your entire cholesterol panel. When I usually give talks, I, I, I list what's called the bad cholesterol or the LDL cholesterol. That should be less than 100. Um, but really, you really need to know everything. What's your total cholesterol? What is your good cholesterol called the HDL cholesterol, which should be greater than 40. I, th you, you, I think you want to aim for it to be greater than 50. And then what's called triglycerides. You know, so you need to know that, that whole panel. And then the, the waist circumference, which is measured at the belly button. The good thing about this is, you think about this, this is something that, that, that the, the metabolic health panel, every man can really know those numbers, right? Because either they're, they're blood tests, or there a blood pressure, which you can get with a home blood pressure cup, or you can get a tape measure and measure your waist circumference. So, so those are numbers every man should know and understand what they mean because they aren't that difficult and they can have a huge impact on how to get optimal health. So you basically sound like this is the same know your numbers that we hear the cardiologist the, the heart specialist talking about yes. so these are really important numbers for us to know and i saw one of my partners out there in the audience who's uh, was sucking it in when you said that about <laughs> the waist circumference so we were <laughs> I, and i tell the guy i tell him sucking it in doesn't count, that doesn't count. I, I was like nope can't do that you guys let it all hang out <laughs> You know, and, and, and it's, it's easy to have the guys kind of get up and stand up and just let everything out. And I just tell them, OK, now look down and they look down. And I said, now, if you can't see a certain organ in your body when you're looking down, then then you got a problem going on. Well, look at that. It's an easy way to get the message across. And we, and we laugh and joke about it. But then they look at it and they said, what? And they said, you're saying if I lose this? I said, that's exactly what I'm saying. Oh, now that's so, a lesson. We'll have to make sure that we capture that. Yeah. That if we can shrink the belly. We may be doing better in some other places that, too. That belly fat is that is a bad actor. It, it 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 increases your risk of diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol. It increases your risk of erectile dysfunction. It increases your risk of low testosterone. You know that it, it does a it does a lot of All things right. that men don't want. All right. Well, let's let's move forward because before we move forward, I just want to make sure I re say some things that you've captured. You talked about this important gland that has dual function. Mm -hmm. urination, and then the role in our sexual health is where I'll leave it at that. Yep. And then you talked about some symptoms that suggest to us that the prostate may not be working well, not necessarily prostate cancer, right. but some other things. So we got symptoms, and then you just hit us with this, know your numbers, this metabolic health thing, and the big thing I'm gonna remember is around <laughs> the belly button, it doesn't uh. count beneath it. 
and you can't suck it that's, that's right. Gotcha. That's right. So, Everybody so, says pan size. I was like, <laughs> I, I don't care what your pan size is because, you, you know, so. so. That's, that's critical information. So now I want to go ahead and address the elephant in the room. Okay. This is Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. And so, you know, this is a dreadful condition and, and uh, something that we need to talk about. And so I want to talk about the thing that seems to keep men away from preventive health checks and just simply the prostate cancer screen. Can you tell me a little sure. bit about what is this screen that we, you, you want to use? Yeah, so, so prostate cancer, you know, it's screening or, I, uh, you know, we, we, we're, we're steering some way from the screening idea and I can get into some specifics of, of who should get that, but we're, we're talking about getting uh, a blood test called a PSA blood test. That stands for prostate specific antigen. And then we're talking about that dreaded rectal exam, the, 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 the finger that no man wants to, want, <laughs> wants to have. And, um, but they're both important. There, there been, there's, there's been kind of a movement to say, oh, all we need is to get the PSA blood test. So let's talk about yeah. that, because I think that's yeah. probably where we really need to move towards, just leave that digital rectal <laughs> exam out, and let's talk about what, what does the prostate-specific antigen do for you when you see those numbers and what should they be before we start worrying about them? So the, the, the PSA test to me, it's, it's, an ind, it's an indicator of potential trouble. Now, PSA, it is not the perfect test because if you look at the range, the range people look at is, is zero to four for your PSA. Um, it, it, you know, and, and that range, can that's, that's kind of the normal range. Uh, four to 10 is a more worry. So above 10, you, you, you get more worried. Um, the zero to four range, you, to me, that's, that's also individual. This is why you, you need to go in and be seen because if you have certain factors that we can talk about, like for instance, if you're, if you're a, an African-American man because we're at higher risk for prostate cancer, if you have a family history of prostate uh, a cancer, if I pick up certain things like you have low testosterone, um, if you're younger, that zero to four range, I may get concerned before you get you get zero to four, but but that's the number everybody looks at zero to four. So so it's 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 a um, it, it, it's a protein that's secreted by the prostate. It is not the perfect test because your PSA can be elevated in the benign enlargement that we just talked about. So you can have a big prostate and your PSA can be elevated. It can be elevated in the inflammatory condition. And again, remember it doesn't have to be an infection. It can be it, 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 with uh, uh, inflammation, and it can be also it can be elevated. If you have certain procedures, you know, if, 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 we, if we take a look in the penis, even if you just do a good thorough rectal exam where you uh, uh, ejaculate too close to having a, a test. So, so it's not the perfect test, but it's a sign of potential trouble and it's a sign of, of I need to maybe take a closer look at you because, you know, could you have prostate cancer? Yeah, okay. so. so. So this test can be affected by those other things. So you're saying that I, I guess we can't get away with not doing the other part of this exam. Uh, so you're saying the PSA since it's imperfect using the, the digital rectal exam. Yeah, I mean, yes. the PSA, and, and, and we can talk later if you want about other, other potential tests. So my reason for doing the digital rectal exam, personally, I, as a urologist and a men's health person, I get useful information out of doing a digital rectal exam. What, what, what are you doing? I mean, all I know is you're in there. Yeah, yeah, I, okay, yes, so what, exactly what's right. What's actually happening when you do this exam? What are you What are you looking for? What are you filling for? So, so the first thing people is like, why do you have to go in through the rectum? Well, if you look at the the the, the anatomy through the rectum, I can directly feel the outside of your prostate. That's where you're most likely to have prostate cancer. So, so I can. So, so what am I looking for when I go in there? One is I'm seeing. Do I feel any funny nodule, any area of firmness? Because if I feel that and I'm suspicious enough, it doesn't really matter what your PSA is. I, you know, I, you, that, that needs to be evaluated. But I get way more information than that. It gives me an estimate of your prostate size. Do you have a huge prostate? But then if your PSA is, is, is elevated and it feels normal and nice and smooth and soft, but you have a huge prostate, well, it could be, it could be ele elevated from, from that. It gives me a sign of, do you have the inflammatory conditions we've been talking about, the, the, the chronic prostatitis? And you won't, and a lot of times, especially in, in, that's a more subtle finding, and it's not just the prostate, it's the, it's the, it's the muscles that run alongside the prostate that I can press on and, and, and find out if you have an inflamed uh, condition. It gives me some information about what is your, what is the tone of your sphincter when I go in to check? 
because a lot of men who come in with, with, uh, for, for men's health, whether it's erectile dysfunction or prostate issues, they have back problems. So, so that, so that the, the nerves, that, that, the, the, you know, their, their, their lower back nerves can be affected and so your, your sphincter tone might be off. So, so there's actually quite a bit of useful information that I get from doing a digital, a digital uh, rectal exam. And, 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 and I mean, the, the good news for men is that we really, you know, we do it pretty quickly, right? You know, we, we're not gonna put you through so a two hour ordeal. How long should it take? How long do I need to not breathe? We say, we say, <laughs> we, I, I tell, I say eight seconds max. I, you know, I, five to eight, it really depends. I mean, if, if I go in there and it's a, it's a normal size prostate and everything's normal, I'm probably done within, within, within five seconds of checking all the things I wanna check. If it's a little bit bigger or there's some things I need to look at, maybe eight, maybe eight, so. Now, now let's talk a little bit more about this exam and what you see. So if you say you, you're looking for inflammation to, mm -hmm. does that mean that when you touch the prostate, does it hurt? Or should, should we experience discomfort as a yes, sign? That that's a great thing? question because, and, and, you know, I actually tell, I tell them, I, I know that this is going to be a little bit uncomfortable, and that's why nobody wants to have it, have it done. But I'm looking for actual pain, you know. So, so, and, and I know because if the if if the prostate itself is is tender, or if it feels kind of boggier than, than than normal, I know that's a different kind of pain. Or even if it's the inflammation around the side of the prostate, if I push on that on that musculature, or the pelvic floor there, these guys almost jump off the table. You know, so it's yeah. So that's exactly what I'm. It's it's not just a discomfort. I said, okay, if it's if it's just uncomfortable for a few seconds, okay, I got that. That's okay. Okay. This is actual pain. You, you know, that that's 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 different. So if it's a normal, healthy prostate, when you do the exam, we don't experience tenderness associated with touching on the prostate or any bumpy thing. So the prostate should be smooth. It, it should it should be it should be smooth. It should be a certain firmness, not a hard nodule, it should be firm because if it's too soft and boggy, that's a sign of inflammation. And it's the prostate and then right on the side of the prostate should, should, not, be, should not be tender. And like I said, the, the, the sphincter, the, the, when, when I go in the rectal sphincter should have a normal, you know, a, a kind of a, a, a normal resistance to it. Okay, I'm gonna go back to something that you'd said before in reference to this exam. You'd said something about the PSA if you've ejaculated the day, the night before, I guess the yeah. prior to this test, yes. that it may cause the PSA to be elevated. So, what's the order you do this test? Because I'm guessing that if you're doing a rectal exam, aren't right. you going to irritate it? So, should you get the PSA before you do the rectal exam, or do you have to wait some time in between? So, in a purist world, you you would, and I try and do that when I can. But in a re the, in the reality of it is, if you're coming in, I'm going to examine you, and then I'll get I'll get I'll go ahead and get the uh, PSA because because unless I do a really you know vigorous or uh, you know exam, which I would only do if I thought you had inflammation or something like that, um, it can impact it. So so the, the 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 honest answer to that is. If I could get a PSA before you come in, I, 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 would, I would do that. But many times, many times uh, I end up doing the exam and, and, and getting it on that same day. What I found, and I've had just, I had actually two of these guys come in even last week where um, they, their, their PSA that had, been, that had been pretty normal, you know, and I, it, it had been like two, two and a half, somewhere there. It came back at like four, four you know, higher than what I wanted. Um, and I hadn't, I hadn't examined them, and the first thing I did was I had them repeated. And, and what I found out was two things. One, um, they had had, they, they had, had uh, uh, sex you know, for a, a couple times you know, for days in a row right before that. So, so usually now I, I'll ask men, abstain from not only intercourse, but any ejaculation, masturbation, anything. Abstain from, from any ejaculation for, uh, for about three days. This guy also noted he had been doing some aggressive uh, uh, bike riding. You know, okay. so you've been kind of bouncing up and down, uh, and and we repeated it. Uh, I, I, I repeated it, uh, and it, it came back perfectly normal where it was before. Okay. Now another question, and and I think you've answered this for me, but I'm going to ask it anyway because I still have hope. Okay. <laughs> Stretching this out a little <laughs> bit. So if I get a have a normal PSA, and a normal digital rectal exam, can I stretch out? the length of time in between having the exam, and let's just say that I am uh, in that 40 to 60 age group. Yeah. 
can we stretch it out to two years instead of every year? So or is that the frequency I, uh, that we should have this exam? I, I don't for over, over for 40 and over, I recommend yearly. So, so, we, so we can talk about the ages, because now the, the way the American Urology Association kind of looks at PSA now is, that, is they talk about having a conversation with your physician. So we're trying to get away from, you're not screening everybody. So, so what are, the, what are the, 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 the age ranges? So if you're, if you're between 40 and, and say 54, the idea with now is you want to be in what we call one of the higher risk groups. So what are one of the higher risk groups of prostate cancer? African American men. And then if you have a family history of uh, prostate cancer, especially in, 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 a, in a first degree relative who's under age 65, those are higher risk groups. So in that 40 to 54, you know, you, you, you should have that conversation. Personally, I think African American men, you need to start being, being screened at age 40. And, 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 you know, you can call it screening or I, I call it just part of, uh, you know, uh, a, a healthy workup because of the increased risk. You know, we're, we're 1.6 times more likely to, to, develop, to develop it and two times more likely to die from, from prostate cancer. That's a risk to me. If, if you're an African-American man and you have a family history, I, I, my, I even will start earlier. Now, if, it, if, if, I, if, if you're in that earlier group, under, you know, 40, would I maybe wait two years if it was really a normal level or very low? I might there, but when you hit 40, I, I don't. I, I've been having them come in at the one year, at the one year mark. So that's the 40 to 54. 55 to say 69, that's where you're at average risk in terms of developing prostate cancer. So if you're not in that high risk group, that's where it's recommended that you have the conversation with your, with your, with your healthcare provider. If you're over 70, the idea behind getting a PSA is, if you have a greater than 10 year life expectancy. Uh, and as you know very well now, I, I see a lot of men who are 70 and over and, and they have, they definitely have more than a 10 year life expectancy. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't tend, I, I tend not to, to slack off if, they, if they're interested in having a, a, a PSA test. Gotcha. So, um, I'm gonna pause for a second before we transition to the next. And I just wanna remind our, our Facebook viewers that uh, if you have questions, feel free to submit them uh, through the, uh, the comment section of Facebook. Um, I'm learning a whole lot about this whole prostate, uh, I guess the whole prostate gland, and we hadn't even started talking about the cancer. So mm -hmm. that's where we're going to shift to. We've okay. talked about the screening aspects of, of uh, the uh, prostate cancer screening and, and the, the uh, essential need for annual exams if you're in the right um, risk group. Mm -hmm. And so before I ask about what we do if you get an abnormal screen, how transparent are, are doctors in letting us know that we're in the high risk group? Because it's enough for us to yeah. get in and, and see, you know, have these evaluations, but it may not be clear to us if we're in that risk group, like if I'm African American, kind of know it. But is that something you share with them? So, I, so you know, I, I encourage all men, but especially African American men. You, this is where you really, you really have to know, and that's why sessions like this are really important. You know, if you're an African American man, you have to know that you should, you should be getting your PSA at age 40. And and, and unfortunately, I've seen where that was kind of that was kind of left out of the discussion and so and so people were actually mistakenly told that oh you can worry don't worry you know you're african american but yeah you can just do it at 50 it's not a big deal you can start later no i mean you, you know sometimes you have to be your own advocate right so so no doctor is going to purposely withhold that that kind of information but sometimes there can be some some confusion you, you know and 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 my feeling is uh, prostate cancer can occur earlier in African American men. It can be it can be more more uh, aggressive. So you really need to start at that at that age forty. So so that's part of the reason why I think you this this kind of education so so that men and women know that you need to start. And if and if and if you're a, if if you're a man and you have prostate cancer, and you have a male child, you need to let you need to let your son know that they're going to be at increased risk and so they you know i, I would start you know, it's, you know when they certainly in their teenage just educating them this is important this is what you need to do you know don't let this slip by when you when you when you reach age 40. okay i'm going to shift for a second to um what we've learned from this pandemic mm -hmm. you know I, I think a lot of 
folks didn't know what it meant when we talked about comorbidities. And in medicine, yes, that's something that we, we throw around all the time. What does that mean in this prostate cancer arena? Are there other conditions that make you at greater risk for developing prostate cancer? So one of the interesting thing, one of the, the interesting things that's that's it, it's it, well it, it's kind of hit the forefront of the literature now, but, but but we've been looking at this for a while is um, one of the ways you can keep your 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 prostate healthy is through a good nutrition plan, right? So so I mean and, and that gets back to some of these 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 metabolic uh, risk factors. So we know, for example, um, obesity, increased waist circumference that can that can uh, uh, impact. Uh, prostate cancer, the, you know, there, there's some reports out of uh, how aggressive the prostate cancer uh, can be. So one of the things that you can do just for overall prostate health, as well as, as, well as is, is uh, eat a healthy diet. So what's a healthy diet, right? I mean, I mean, what do I mean by a healthy nutrition plan? Well, there's been a lot of play with, 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 with plant-based, you know, what, what is, you know, plant-based nutritional strategies. So, so you know, eating, and I tell people, I'm not the meat police. I'm not going to force you not to, not to eat meat, but you can, you can eat more vegetables and it can be healthy. There were, um, there were three interesting papers that came out recently at the, the recent American uh, Urology Association meeting, abstracts that, that came out, and they looked at plant-based foods, plant-based nutrition strategies, and, and uh, PSA and prostate cancer. So what they noted was, was that uh, men who ate, a plant, and, and I say more plant-rich. I, I call it more of a plant-rich uh, a, a strategy. Um, they had lower PSAs than those who didn't. They also looked at uh, prostate cancer risk, and especially risk of aggressive prostate cancer, and plant-based eaters uh, uh, had, um, had lower risk there. And this fits perfectly into every, I, 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 see this, I see this all the time in my clinical practice. So, so that made perfect sense. It's something that, that we've been observing for a, few, for a few years. And then the third study looked at erectile dysfunction. And, and it said men, again, who had a, a, a plant-based nutrition life, uh, lifestyle um, tended to have less erectile dysfunction. And all of this makes sense to me because that sort of lifestyle change impacts your metabolic health parameters. So it certainly is going to hit, and we haven't talked much about erectile dysfunction, but I know we will, but it's certainly going to hit that aspect. But same thing with cancer. And, and, and here's the beauty of it. People always say, well, what, what kind of uh, plan should I eat for prostate health? And then what should I eat for my cardiovascular and metabolic health? And, and the beauty of it is, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. You know, whole food, plant-rich diet, is you know the same thing that, that's going to help your prostate is also going to help you to, you know decrease your risk of heart attack, stroke because it's, it's going to improve all those four metabolic parameters that I talked about. It's the same thing. Okay, so so we again back to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen more patients getting diagnosed um, at a later stage of prostate cancer because we had this period where we couldn't get to the doctor. Right, right. So I, I think, I, I, you know, I think if you look, and I can't give you the exact numbers for prostate cancer, but, but just in general with, with, with screenings and that, those dropped off because people just weren't coming in to the, the doctor. So, so um, you know, I would expect that, that, we, that we probably were seeing men when you're, you're coming, because you may have missed, what, 18, I mean, you may have missed like a, a year, year and a half coming in. So picking up people that, that their, their PSAs were, were, were elevated. Yeah, I would expect that that's been a, a trend. How much of a major trend? Uh, you know, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, good, a, good, a good question. But certainly men were missing those, those annual screens. So, so, so what I try and encourage men to do is get back in the, jump back on the bandwagon right now, right? Go in and get that, that uh, testing done. All right. Well, that's going to be a stay tuned. We'll see what, what continues to trickle out. I, I, th I think that will be. I think that will be, yeah. So let's, let's go ahead and talk about um, prostate cancer. Let's say that we get the abnormal screen. You know, the PSA is abnormal. The rectal exam is also abnormal. What do we, what do, walk me through what happens next. So if you have an abnormal PSA or rectal exam, let's just, you know, the, the, most, the more common scenario probably is that the, the, your your, your PSA blood test uh, is ab abnormal. Um, and after I've, I've done a good exam, first thing, the first thing I'll, I'll often do, depending on, on what the level is, is, is I'll, 
I'll just re repeat it. So there are a few things we can do. You know, we, we can repeat the test because if it's, a, if it's a milder elevation, let's say you're somewhere between four and 10, where it's, it's not a huge ele you know, you know, elevation, I'll repeat it because again, you know, it, it, it may be your enlarged prostate, it may be an, 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 an inflammation. But let's say you have it so that we really feel that your, your PSA is higher than, we, than we're comfortable with and what we, we can do. So there are a couple things that, that we can do. There are some other tests besides PSA that we could that we could look at that, that, are, that are newer newer tests. The, the names aren't important. They, they can look at different fractions of PSA. They can look at what's called a free PSA. Uh, that if that if that's a low if that's lower than that that's a that's a higher indication of pro, of, of having prostate cancer. There are other things that, that we can do. The ultimate thing, if you're really suspicious, is you have to look at doing a prostate biopsy, right? So you, you need to go in and get, a, and uh, we, we do this actually right in the, right in the, in the office, um, uh, where, where with the, at least for the, for the standard ones, you, you go in with, a, with, an, with an ultrasound probe so we can visualize the prostate, very small needle, and you can take tissue, tissue samples. To, to confirm your, 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 your di the diagnosis. Because you have to have a diagnosis of prostate cancer before you're going to treat somebody, right? Yeah. So this, this is, is, there's a lot of good news that you put into this in terms of how you're confirming that this was an abnormal test. So not even relying simply on the PSA and the abnormal rectal exam now. I'm not gonna remember all those fancy tests you just said, but just to know that there are some other pieces to the pie that you're going to look at to ensure that that an invasive test like a biopsy would be needed. Yes, and, it all, and it, again, it, it depend, each situation is, is, is individual. If, if your level comes back, at, if it's a certain level, and, and I mean, let's say you came back and I'll just throw out a number, you know, PSA of 15, you confirm it's still 15, well, you don't need to go do a whole lot. I mean, you need to get a biopsy to find out, <laughs> you know, yeah. unless, you've, unless I feel like, boy, you were inflamed when I, when I examined you or you just had a procedure or something like that. But yeah, there are other tests that, that we can do. Because remember I said PSA is not a, is not a perfect test. Not a perfect it's test. not a perfect test. Now I'm gonna go to quickly, just because we're talking about PSA and numbers to one of the Facebook questions. Uh, they asked, do I need a digital examination if I have my PSA exam? If they have the PSA test, I guess is what they're asking. And it's been normal. They're 71 right. years old. Right. So okay, so this is this is a good question because it's it's, it's getting at a, a a a well, it's a controversy in medicine. It's not a controversy for me. So, but there there is this whole field of thought now. If you have a PSA and it's normal, you don't you don't have to do the digital. As we were saying earlier, I get certain information from the rectal exam. So 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 my feeling, I don't look at the prostate in isolation. Prostate health and doing a prostate exam is part of my overall men's health evaluation for you. So I'm going to look at your metabolic health. I'm going to look at it, and and I get useful information from a digital rectal exam. You know, five to eight seconds, and I get that. So so I do it. But but that's a but that's a very good question because there that, that is in the, the the literature now. Well, should we just not be doing digital rectal exams? And and remember this this particular. Um listener is 71 years old and you just mentioned something about if you're a hef healthy 71 that they're 10 years ahead of you then we may they, if, if he's a healthy 71 then he's going to have uh, you know w well over a 10-year life expectancy so why would i treat him any different than i would treat somebody else in terms of what kind of comprehensive evaluation am i am i going to, to, to do for you okay. that's not that, that you know that's like i said that's that's the way I, I approach, approach men, so, right. yeah. So let's, let's jump back into the abnormal test. Let's say you got the biopsy and it confirms what we most dreaded, that it is prostate, prostate cancer, if I can spit that out. Yes, <laughs> okay. get that. So what's next? You know, what are the treatment options that we yeah. should be thinking about? And is there a difference between watchful waiting or active surveillance? What is all that? Sure. About? So when you get the biopsy back, what the biopsy is going to tell you a, a couple things. It's going to tell you what, what kind of the grade of the cancer is. So that's like the, the, the severity. And, and some of this may be getting too technical. We used to look at something what we, what we call a, a Gleason score. And you know, if you're a Gleason 6, that's kind of the, 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 um, the, the least aggressive. Now we go to something called a group score that kind of takes the Gleason scores and you get a group 1 through 5. Bottom line is, you'll get an idea of, of what do we believe based on pathology, how aggressive is that, is that 
uh, cancer. Then, then what are what are the what are the, uh, the the treatments? So you mentioned watchful waiting versus active surveillance. Um, what's the difference? Is well, well, the, I think what most of us do now, or most of the, the the oncology specialists do now, is is more active surveillance. So watchful waiting was just really just watching and following, looking at the PSA and things like that. Active surveillance is different in that. We, we do follow your, you know, serial PSA levels. Um, you, you get serial exams. You'll get you'll get biopsies also at intervals because because the, the, the more active part is we want to find out if since you go from a, a Gleason six, which is which is less, uh, which is which is less uh, uh, worrisome than a Gleason seven. If that transition occurs, we want to know that. So you're going to get biopsies, uh, you know, uh, uh, along the way because we're actively watch, we're actively surveilling what's going on. Now, many men with low grade can uh, uh, cancers, you can you can do that. So so you, know, you don't you don't have to have um, surgery for every prostate cancer. That's the, so, so, so I would say more people now probably do active surveillance than just do the, the watchful waiting, but just because we're keeping a closer eye on things. Then what's the next treatment option? Well, then you get into surgery. You know, you can have, you can have surgery. We can do, there are all different types of, of uh, uh, surgery. Um, there's open surgery. When I, when I, when I trained at, at, uh, at, at Hopkins, I mean, you know, <laughs> I'm probably sure my age now, but, but we, we were, we were, most everything was open initially. Then now, you, as, 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 you, as you know, there's robotic surgery, there's laparoscopic, there you can, do, you can do all different routes. So there are a number of ways that we can do the surgery. The surgery, you're removing the prostate gland. So you're, you are taking the prostate gland out and then you are taking the bladder and you're reconnecting it to the penis. So you take the prostate and, and, and that's the, in the prostatic urethra, all that comes out and then you take the bladder and, you, and actually you pull it down to the, the uh, penis and you, and you reconnect it there. And that'll get into some of the things we can talk about a little bit about the, uh, with some of the potential uh, uh, or, or side effects of, of erectile dysfunction and incontinence. So, so you have that. That you have surgery. You have a, you have a, a radiation option. So there are a couple types of, 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 of radiation therapy you can have. You can have what's called external beam radiation therapy, which is a machine that that's that that's that's shooting uh, X-rays externally. Um, that that's fairly common. The, the the machines have gotten very sophisticated now uh, in terms of this. You know, you can get 3D imaging and very directed strategy. There's also another form of radioactive. Uh, sorry, another form of radio. Uh, radiation therapy that's called uh, seed therapy, brachytherapy, where you actually implant uh, uh, seeds into the prostate uh, that, that will locally uh, emit radiation therapy. So you, so you have that. Um, uh, and then, let's see, other, other forms. So those are, the, those are kind of the, the, the main ones. There's something called cryotherapy that, that we can do, but the, the cryotherapy or freezing the prostate for the most part now, that's done more if you're not a good candidate for surgery or radiation or if you fail one of the other, other therapies, sure. but that's available. And, and, and so then if, then if the prostate has spread, if the cancer has spread, then you have other things. You have, you know, hormone therapy, which we could, we could talk about. That's, uh, or um, uh, different chemotherapies or even, uh, you know, a vaccine therapy. So what I, but, but the ones I mentioned and went into depth more, that's more for more localized uh, prostate cancer that you that you want to. Um, so yeah. so so if you you're telling me there are a lot of different options, surgery is is clearly the one that I think most of us think about when we think about uh, developing prostate cancer. But there are radiation. The are the medications just the hormone therapy, or are there other medicines that we sometimes use in yeah. treating? Yeah, the, the, the medication for prostate, that, that would be hormone therapy. It's really a form of, of, of castration, you know, blocking the production of tes testosterone. So you can do that, I mean, you can do it surgically too. You can, do, you can just re remove the testicles, and, but, but nowadays we usually use more of a medical form of, of, of therapy. But, um, yeah, but but for the localized forms, you're right. You do have you have a choice, and one of the things that people will do is, is uh, you know they'll they'll have you go out and look at the choice. I just had a family member recently that was that was younger. He was in his I think he was in his fifties, early mid fifties, diagnosed with uh, uh, prostate cancer was one of the very treatable forms, and you know he just did he just did not want to have surgery. You know I mean he 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 really wanted to have radiation therapy. He waived all of his his odds, and he ended up getting. 
uh, and, and external beam uh, radiation therapy regimen and, and uh, um, you know, each of them have their own potential side effects, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, so there's some drawbacks to to, to to any to any of them. Okay. Yeah. So, so I'm still stuck back in in the uh, the surgery that you described, removing the prostate and um, dealing with the testicles, and those are very sensitive areas for for men. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, what happens after this operation. What yeah. what can we expect? Sure. Sure. So yeah. So so let's go with with because uh, with, with the surgical prost with the prostatectomy, it's called a radical prostatectomy. That's what it's called. Um, so so we, that doesn't involve the testicles. The testicles was a different one, just to, to make sure people are clear. So we're talking about just removing the prostate. Um, the the two biggest concerns that men have there are one erectile dysfunction, and then what's going to be your urinary continence, and erectile dysfunction uh, the, the, is an important discussion because the nerves that help get you an erection run right alongside of the prostate. Now, we have gotten very good, or the surgeons, I, I, I don't do the, this, the, that, that particular surgery anymore, but the surgeons have gotten very good at what we call sparing the nerve. So a nerve sparing prostatectomy where we can take the prostate out, push those nerves aside, take the prostate out and, 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 and the uh, uh, cancer, and, and so preserve those nerves. Now. Where we won't preserve the nerves is if the cancer has spread into that with the area where the nerves are. If there's anything in question, then we're going to take the nerves along with the prostate to get the prostate because you want the cancer out first. Um, so the, why is that important? Because if you have a nerve sparing prostatectomy, you have a better chance of uh, regaining erectile function, especially using some of the oral medications uh, that, 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 are, that are out there now. Um, so that's one, it's the, the erectile uh, the, the dysfunction. People often say, well, how can I prevent that? I, I try and be honest with people and say, you're probably going to take some sort of hit on your erectile function, even with a perfect nerve sparing procedure. Now, you know what one of the best predictors of erectile function after surgery is? What's your, what's your, uh, what's your condition going in? What do you mean? I mean, I mean, so, so if you, and, and this gets back to, everything goes back to metabolic health. If you've got diabetes, high blood pressure, you've got a number of things going on, and maybe your erections are already borderline. You're already having mm -hmm. some problems. Mm -hmm. I, I can tell you after the surgery, you're, you're going to have more problems. Not that we can't correct them now. I mean, I mean we, we, can, we, can, we, can, we can correct them. So your, your preoperative erectile function state is, is, is important to, to know, so that we know kind of what to expect afterwards. Um, wow. Yeah, yeah. So it sounds like you said that when you, and is this with all of the treatment choices we have, that having prostate cancer, can we just expect to have erectile dysfunction even if we're getting uh, radiation or hormone So therapy? with radiation, yeah, so here's the difference. With, so yes, radiation can lead to it. It can be a more delayed onset, right? Because when you're taking the prostate out, it's a more immediate onset. Whereas if you're doing radiation, it could be a more de de delayed onset. But you know, I, I didn't say that it was inevitable that you were going to have erectile dysfunction. I said you may you, you may notice a hit with your erect with your function. It doesn't mean that with 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 treatments and all, we can't get we'll, we'll get you back to a functioning state because that's one of my big messages. Because I've had men come into me who just who said I'm not getting the surgery because. You know, I don't want to get erectile dysfunction, so I'm, I'm just I'm just not doing it, or 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 or, or I'm not going to go get a get a checkup for my for my PSA because I, I wouldn't get the surgery anyway, no matter what. And so what I tell them is, I, I say two things. First of all, we can fix the erectile dysfunction. I mean, that's what I do. That's my area of specialty is is, is sexual medicine. So we can fix that. And secondly, you know. It, if you have prostate cancer and you die, you're not going to be getting an erection anyway, right? So really, if you think about it from that perspective, <laughs> get the cancer taken, taken care of. We can address the other issue on the back end. I like to be honest with people right up front and just say, this is what you might be, this is what you're going to expect, okay? But what we're going to do is, as soon as you get through that surgery and you get recovered, we're, 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 we're going to be on top of this. So there, the good news is that, yes, you may can expect or anticipate a hit, but there are some great recovery yes. medications and yes. other therapies that can happen. There are two other areas I want to hit on this, and then I want to really ask one that's, uh, that's involving the partner. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned bladder issues as well. So we got the erectile dysfunction yes. and then bladder problems. 
And then you talked about hormone therapy and, and how it would affect the testicles. So, yes. So then I imagine testosterone problems too. So talk about the bladder and the testosterone. So, so from the bladder, the, the, as I mentioned, when, we, when you have prostate cancer, we take, your, we take the entire prostate out. So the, so the prostate helps you with uh, remaining continent so you don't leak urine. So when, when we take that out and we, and we take the bladder and bring it down to the urethra, um, men can have problems with what we call stress incontinence, where we, maybe if you laugh or cough or sneeze, you know, that, that urine leaks out. Now again, the, my surgical colleagues have gotten really good at you can kind of reconstruct things and you, and you, and you, and you, and you try and, and you try and avoid that. That's just one of the potential complications. Now, that's something you can early on have some leakage problems. And then we have you do things over time. You, you know, you've heard of a Kegel exercise. So we may have you urinate and then try and just squinch and just, and just stop your stream. Mm -hmm. So there are things that we do to, to help you build up those, those uh, muscles again. Uh, so that's something that you definitely over time I can see improvement with that. Just like over time you can see improvement with uh, erectile function with both of those. But those are, those are two real things that can happen. And I think you just got to be honest with men. Um, uh, you, you know, but, but, I, but I will say we, we've gotten more and more sophisticated in, in addressing both with the nerve sparing and with the continence issue. Uh, yeah. And so let's go to the, the testosterone. So low testosterone is a, a consequence of, of the treatment? So if you get what we call hormonal therapy, then basically what we're doing is we're giving you medicines that, that will stop the production of testosterone. So, so we're almost, we're, we're inducing a low testosterone state. So I see guys who come in because they have low testosterone from natural aging or diabetes mm -hmm. or blood pressure, things like that. With, if, you're, if you have prostate cancer and we have to treat you with hormones, we're inducing a low testosterone state. So what are the symptoms you can get there? You can get, you get a number of symptoms. Besides being you know, just, just tired, low energy, low sex drive, um, it, it, uh, what we call androgen deprivation therapy can also predisp or, or increase your risk for uh, high blood sugar and things like that too. So it's not something that we take lightly, but you know, again, it, it's, it's one of the treatments that we may have to, have to do. So, so Dr. Billups, you've talked to us about some really devastating consequences of going on to develop prostate cancer. And all that I sense from this is the earlier that we're diagnosed, the more we may limit some of those residual outcomes. Yes. I want to talk a little bit about how does this affect the spouse, the partner? Sure. Because I imagine, uh, you know, and, and do you invite mental health in? Because I imagine you get diagnosed with this, this radical surgery where you're messing around with the bladder and the penis seems like it can be devastating and then losing function even for a period of time. How are we dealing with the individual's mental health? Yeah. But also, how are we prepping the partners, the spouse, the, yeah. in this setting? So, so that's another really good point in, in terms of looking at the, the you're obviously right, with the, with the whole mental health aspect, with, with depression, stress, anxiety, from not only the man who's going through this and you're getting all this information thrown at you, yeah, for the, for, the, for the spouse also. That's why I think it's important that these conversations need to be had as a couple because the, it, 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 most of the, of the spouses that I know, they do much better if they know what's, what's coming. They're actually very supportive. They, you know, cause, because one, they want you alive <laughs> and they want you around. And, and, and I think and the more they can understand, look, we can take care of this erectile dysfunction and, 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 and other, other problems. Um, but I have a low threshold for if there's depression or, or, or undue stress and anxiety with um, working with, with one of my psychiatry or psychology colleagues to, as, as, a, support, as a support network there. Uh, but, but that, I think, is very important that you, that you bring the, the spouse on board and they understand fully not only what's going on, and most of them are, honestly. You know, I mean, they're involved in the decision, but they also understand these are the side effects. This is what we're going to be facing afterwards. And, and so what is the expectation, just timeline, that you would expect uh, to see improvement after they've had the operation? Yes. Uh, because I, I would imagine even for them being able to know when can I expect to not 
uh, need to wear depends because I'm having right. you know bladder accidents. So some of that, as you can imagine, is is variable depending on what the anatomy was. Did you have something where they had to do radiation therapy before, or, or you know, with the surgery? But what I try and, and, and get men comfortable with is, I would say, think of this as um, this is a, this is a marathon, not a, a sprint, right? I mean, if you carry your, if you tear your Achilles tendon, you're not going to be out running around at full speed right right away. So so I try and tell them like, let's look at this over the course of say even up to a 12 month window, you know, and we're going to assess progress along the way. Now you have some men. I mean, my gosh, they're 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 continent and getting erections. <laughs> Within a month of the surgery, I mean, right, 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 right away. But that's okay. That's then, then that's great. If that happens to you, that's fine. And and a lot of those men were extremely healthy to begin with. I'll be, I mean, they 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 didn't have any comorbidities. They were they were physically in good shape. But I try and tell people, we're I want to measure progress over 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 months, and then see see where we are, you know. And so, <clears throat> so when we look at all of this. The question that I have is we've gotten a lot more savvy as a community when it comes to mental health. Has mental health or getting psychologists involved at the onset, at diagnosis, when we're first having these discussions, either uh, family counseling or something, is that now more of the norm? Uh, when we diagnose a man with prostate cancer? So I, I won't say it's 100% the norm. I would say it's, it occurs much more frequently now than it used to because, because you're bringing up a, a, a really good point. You know, in, in my opinion, you ought to get that kind of support. I also try and encourage my, um, my, my uh, colleagues who do the surgery, get the couple in to see me first because I'll talk with them about the uh, erectile issues and, and, and I'll say this is what might happen this is what we can do that takes a lot of anxiety away right there right when it's like you know we, we can handle this if this if this happens we, we can handle it so so um, I think we're getting better about that I, I think that 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 uh, some places do it better than others and it's something that we could we could even improve more on Dr. Billows we have a, another question on Facebook and it's it's uh, about something that we've talked about a little bit and I want to make sure that we address this question from uh, this listener um, said, his first morning urinary flow is sometimes slow. I'm basically okay the rest of the day. He takes a diuretic for his blood pressure uh, with his breakfast. Should he be concerned about that first urinary stream being slow? No, I, I honestly, I, if, if the rest of the day is fine, I would not, I would not worry about that. For, for some reason, a, a lot of men, the, the first one, and, and I, don't ask me why, I can't tell you, you know, but, but that is a, a, a symptom that I hear quite a bit. So I would, I would not be concerned if, if the rest of the day he's doing fine. So this, this hour has really just flown by. Wow. I want to give you an opportunity to just give some last thoughts uh, to our listeners, uh, and then we'll close out. But I really appreciate all this information. We've really hit a lot of uh, different areas. So let me let you speak, uh, and then we'll close out. Sure. So, so uh, you know, I, I think what we tried to really show today was prostate health, prostate cancer is an important component of overall men's health. And, and, and a lot of things work together. We, we talked about some of the metabolic health issues. I think the biggest thing that we need to do, not only among uh, healthcare providers, but also from the, among the public, is we need to change from what I call a last mile mentality to a first mile mentality. So what do, what do I mean by that? Medical folks, and everybody, we're, in, we're much more into a, 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 the, the last mile mentality, which means let me wait till I get sick, until I, until I either get diabetes, high blood pressure, cancer, whatever, and then I'm gonna spring into action. And as providers, we're gonna try and cure you, and, and, and if people, we're, 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 gonna, we're gonna get something done. We need to shift that to what I call a first mile mentality, which really, really gets to more prevention, early detection. It's the idea that why shouldn't we look at how can we live a thriving life, right? So, so why can't I think health is not just the absence of disease. Why can't I live a thriving life? And that, and that I don't want to get any of these things, but, you know, but if I do, I'm going to take care of it and don't, don't ever want to get it again. It's much more of a, of a, of a, of a, of a first mile. And, and, and that's a mindset shift that I think everybody has to go through. I think for the general public, the first thing that, that you can do is the more that you're educated, and hopefully we were able to help people today, the more you can advocate to you, you know, you, you can advocate for, for, your, for yourself. 
you know, you shouldn't be afraid to go in and have a conversation with your with your healthcare uh, a provider. And then I think as providers, we need to change our mindset also on what's on what's important. So that's what I've kind of tried to do in, in my practice. And, and and you know, you have the symptoms. Medicines treat symptoms, but you got to get to the underlying cause. So the first thing I tell the guys with ED is, is I can put you on all the pills and injections or whatever you want. I can do all that stuff. If we aren't addressing what's causing this, all I'm doing is masking the symptom. I'm not doing you any favor, and I'm not really taking care of the problem for you. So, so kind of an integrated approach. And, I, and I'll stop there, but I, I think oh, we, man, we, we, we cover is, a lot. That is just fantastic. I mean, you've really, uh, I've been educated quite a bit, and I love the slogan, we may have to steal shamelessly in, in this <laughs> setting, but, but we'll try to mm. change that paradigm shift from that last mile mentality to that first mile and get into the preventive uh, measures that we need to do. So thank you so much for all of that great information. Uh, we're going to close out. Man Up Men's Health is an organization that's very simple. We're focused on equipping and empowering and educating men on how they can live a healthier life. We love these opportunities to just share with you, so please look on our website to review this, uh, this uh, session that we've just had. Really want to uh, give a shout out to Scarrett Bennett for always being there for us, giving us a space and opportunity to, to present these uh, sessions to you. My name is Dedrick Moulton, Man Up Men's Health. Thank you guys for joining us.